resume it letting everyone in and i'm turning right. off the weight room and then let's get i think that's frank um mcintyre let's get him let's get his name switched over because i gave him my direct link that's the person who says steve right yeah okay good morning good afternoon everyone we're just getting everyone settled in here and i'm going to change my screen name There we go. And uh, I see uh, Frank. I, it looks like uh, looks like you you were, you were able to get in using that direct link I sent you. I'm just going to have Parker change your name over because you're showing up as me on there. So <clears throat> I think that was you, Frank. Just give me a nod if that's you. Well, he was there a minute ago. Okay, well, let's, there's a few people still, uh, still getting <clears throat> settled in here. Let's give them a chance to get their audio connections. And uh, we'll go from there. Great to see some familiar names and faces. Yeah, Frank, I'm, I'm gonna change your name over to, uh, to you. And then you can go in, in and edit that too if you want. It's, it's showing up as me, and you know we don't want folks to get you and I confused. Yeah, that was uh, unusual. How to? <laughs> it's just that direct link I sent you. Uh, you said you were having trouble getting getting your <clears throat> registration confirmation through. So glad you made it in. And uh, you you should be able to uh, go up and click on those three little dots up in the right hand corner of your screen and you can change your your name if to whatever you want if you want to, i just put frank in there but you can put if you want to put your last name in there that's fine too great to see everyone i know we've got uh we've got quite a few slides i'm going to try and get through with you guys today we're gonna we're gonna continue our conversation um along the lines of screening, assessment, and then treatment planning. And this, this really is sort of this subsequent process uh, along this, the lines of uh, evaluating patients in a clinical setting. So really happy to have you all here. And uh, as I said earlier, it's great to see some familiar names and, and faces. I have with me, uh, from our comms uh, team, uh, Parker Laney, who will uh, be doing the introductory slides and getting getting us set up and ready to go. And then um, I'll get my slide dug up and we'll jump right in. So really glad to have you all here. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague, Parker, to get the introductory slides started. So thank you for being here, everybody. Well, everyone's here for the ESAS Clinical Evaluation Assessment. Um, obviously, Steve and Stein, our national ATTC manager, is going to be presenting for us today. And the American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center is a part of a much larger U.S.-based ATTC network. We're based out of University of Iowa and the College of Public Health, the Native Center for Behavioral Health. And here's a map that shows where the centers are around the country. Uh, and so the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center is supported by a grant from SAMHSA. But the content of this event is the creation of the presenters and the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA, HHS, or the American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC. And following today's event, there will be a follow-up email, which will have a link to the recording today, slides, how to request a CEU, and we'll have a GIPRA dropped in the chat. You can follow for the survey, and you can also just, it'll be an email as well. And every time we have an event, we like to take some time to acknowledge the land. If you would just like to take a minute to read our land acknowledgement, it was created by members of our team, Keeley and Abby Driscoll.
Thank you for taking some time to read the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that injustices are still being committed against indigenous people on Turtle Island today. But we wanna say thank you to those that make us stand with indigenous people and acknowledge land reparations must be made to allow healing for our indigenous people and to mother earth herself. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to today's speaker, Stephen Stein. He's the project manager at the National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC Center in Iowa. We're at the University of Iowa's College of Public Health, and I'll turn the floor over to Steve here. What do you want to say? Well, again, thank you, Parker. Uh, as some of you know, my name is Steve Steine. I uh, am one of the uh, managers here at the American Indian Alaska Native HTC. I oversee the addictions portion of uh, our, our um, center. And I come from a clinical background, so uh, I'm able to draw upon my own clinical experiences uh, in working with patients, particularly in uh, behavioral health, substance use disorders, uh, co-occurring or comorbid uh, mental health disorders, and other uh, issues related to uh, adolescents, working with adolescent populations, as well as uh, family, families that are impacted or affected by substance use disorders. Uh, I've been here at the center since January of 2019. Uh, though I'm non-native, I have uh, uh, access to a wonderful advisory council who is made up of um, Native, American, uh, Native, Native American and Alaska Natives all over the country, uh, including uh, our friends up in Alaska. And uh, so we're really blessed and fortunate to have access to a uh, great deal of indigenous wisdom and knowledge, and they guide us in every step of the way. So I want to tip my hat to all of the uh, advisory council. Uh, there may be a few uh, here on the call today. Um, I haven't had a chance to look through the, the uh, audience as we've grown a little bit since signing on. So just want to say uh, uh, thank you again to everybody for joining. And I'm going to see now if I can get uh, my slides up and, uh, and we'll go from there. Got quite a few slides we'll, we'll try and get uh, through today. Um, <clears throat> my hope is that we can, uh, can get through these and have maybe a little bit of time uh, at the end. Uh, if you want to throw some comments in the chat box, uh, that's great. Or gosh, feel free to you know unmute yourself and jump in there if there's something that you're uh, would like me to revisit or come back to. I'm just going to try and get this uh, full screen up without <clears throat> breaking anything. Can you guys see that full screen? Parker, does that look uh, okay to you? You need to swap your view real quick. I'm going to swap the view. All right, here we go. There, how about this? Looks perfect now. Great, 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 great. So, <clears throat> um, as some of you know that uh, have attended and continue to attend the ESES series, uh, this particular uh, section, these last, these these uh, last couple uh, of ESAS presentations, um, and then next month we're going to move into treatment planning. But this really is; these three are very closely connected because it really is talking about this this uh, sort of continuum. Uh, that happens during uh, our engagements, uh, our engagement with a patient from uh, an initial screening or consult, moving all the way through to that uh, admission orientation and treatment planning phase uh, where the patient is fully engaged and under our care. Uh, so today we're going we're gonna to really talk about um, the assessment portion and this, these are just a couple of uh, bullet points uh, to sort of uh, lay the groundwork for uh, what we're gonna talk about today. So the assessment is this systematic process of interacting with the patient to observe and gather this relevant information so that, um, so that we can begin to put together uh, recommendations uh, appropriate treatment recommendations and uh, course of treatment, uh, if if that is deemed you know clinically um, uh, necessary. Um, this this information gathering is an interaction with the patient. 
it's the, it really is the clinical building block for everything that we do moving forward. And I know when I, the latter part of my career, career in, in the outpatient clinic that I managed, uh, we, we hired and trained a lot of new clinicians coming out of uh, school or uh, freshly credentialed. And, and I would really make this, this point uh, with them that without that assessment, without that initial assessment as part of the evaluation, we're really flying blind. It would be comparable to uh, you know, a, a primary care physician seeing a patient and trying to develop uh, a course of action or a, a, a treatment plan without having any access to their file or any information gathered, or even more so, a surgeon going into surgery to perform a procedure with no information. Uh, it just You just couldn't do that. So I know that's kind of an extreme example, but if we look at it through a medical model lens, we really see that this assessment, this gathering of information in a responsible, professional, and non-biased way is really one of the most essential things that we offer our patients, whether or not they come back for further services or not. Um, so just keep that in mind as we, as we go through and talk about this. Um, remember, the, the purpose of screening is to, is to determine whether or not uh, the individual needs further assessment and evaluation. We talked about that last month. The purpose of assessment is really to gather the detailed information needed to develop uh, a recommendation for further services and subsequently a treatment plan or treatment goals uh, that, that may uh, address the needs for why they came in to see you in the first place. So I hope that makes sense. So I want you to think of this as this sort of continuum or uh, sequential sort of process. And if you remember a, a graph that I showed you guys last month where the screening is usually uh, brief and uh, sometimes self-administered, um, but it really acts as sort of a foothold or a gateway to making a referral uh, for further evaluation or further assessment. Um, but think of it as screening and then identifying uh, uh, any issues or concerns in that assessment and then really personalizing that and looking at what's going on with this patient, uh, and particularly in this context, how it relates to their uh, substance use or lack thereof. But again, uh, the screening is the process of evaluating the possible presence of a particular issue. Um, the outcome is, is normally gathered by kind of a simple yes or no. It's very, you know, its intentions are very clear. Assessment is, is really, you know, the process of defining what these issues are, uh, determining whether a, there's a diagnosis, in this case, a substance use disorder diagnosis, and then developing specific recommendations based on that. And we'll talk, as we'll talk about next month, developing an individualized treatment plan to, to help that patient uh, begin their recovery process. So again, uh, we, we look here um, at, at sort of, the, and think of rather cost, think of more, more this more as, uh, take the word cost out and put, if it makes it easier, put time or time uh, invested. And you can see that, you know, this, this particular uh, graphic shows that the screening the amount of cost or resources or time invested is very low, and then that branches out and becomes greater as we move through this assessment process. Um, so again, from, from screening to assessment, the amount of information and time needed uh, increases uh, as you engage with this patient further. Um, so again, it's, it's, this, it's, this, it's this idea of uh, sequential uh, assessment. Um, so again, um, we're also going to talk uh, and sort of conceptualize this idea of a multi-dimensional assessment. So information that is being gathered along sort of three levels or three dimensions. Uh, in this case, and in this context, we're looking at the use of substances, 
the signs and symptoms of that substance use and the related consequences uh, connected to that substance use. The initial step is to ensure that the patient meets the level of care by gathering patients, the patients, for example, medical history, uh, such as previous treatments or any current treatments that they're engaged in, or uh, uh, that use history, what's led up to, what, what sort of use patterns have they, uh, are they reporting? Uh, is there a pattern identified there? Um, how much, how often, um, age of onset, uh, all of these things we begin to look at further in this assessment process. We know that there's uh, clear evidence that shows uh, as a predictor the age of onset. In other words, the earlier the patient reports starting to use, use a certain substance, the more likely it is they're going to have problems later on as a young adult or into their adult lives. So just so these are some things to think about, you know, and then I mentioned earlier this idea of looking at the consequences. I, I firmly believe that, you know, most patients that we work with um, are going to be more ready to change once what they're gaining from or what the they see as benefits from their substance use begin to be outweighed or overshadowed by what they're giving up or what those consequences are. So if a patient's experienced significant consequence related to their alcohol and drug use, they may be more open or receptive to this idea of making a change. <clears throat> so uh, the, the content of screening, uh, again, you know, I want to I want to revert back to this because there's a real it's really important to understand the difference between screening and this assessment or evaluation as part of the evaluation process. The screening a brief process that answers a couple of questions. One, whether or not alcohol or drug use, there's an alcohol or drug use problem present and to try and predict whether it's likely uh, to require a, sort of a brief intervention, like a, an entry level uh, intervention or something more advanced or a higher level of care, which would then result in this referral uh, for example, in the in the expert screener, it really is uh, a screener set up for that uh, for us to be able to make a referral to to treatment or to uh, a substance abuse formal substance abuse evaluation. Okay, so in today's presentation, we're going to have some some quizzes, just some short quiz questions. I used to do these as polling questions, but let's just try this first quiz question: True or false? Collateral information when assessing a patient's needs is rarely required to determine an accurate diagnosis. True or false? What do we think? We're, we're getting, I'm looking at the chat here. Deborah says false. Carlina says false. I've got, yeah, you guys are right on. We know, we know that collateral information is vital to help us determine. Uh, uh, oftentimes the diagnosis and whether or not um, a treatment recommendation is, is warranted. So keep that in mind. Collateral information comes in many different forms, but it is essential uh, in that assessment process. If we're doing accurate, responsible, professional, and ethical uh, and clinically sound assessments, there will be collateral information involved in this information gathering process. So the content of problem assessment, this, uh, this examines problems that are connected to one's alcohol or drug use. Um, there are really are three methods or techniques available. Uh, this retrospective method, this prospective method, and this laboratory sort of method where we're, we're testing or screening to uh, to address the level uh, uh, or um, severity of the, the problem. Um, so retrospective obviously is looking back. That's where we're gonna look at use history, uh, what led up to the, the presenting problem, what, you know, what led up to them coming in that day, sometimes gathering that in sort of a, a summary form. You know, usually most, most evaluations or 
uh, comprehensive uh, evaluations have that section, that very first sort of box uh, presenting problem. You know, we've seen this. It may be worded a little different. Prospective is really trying to predict or uh, understand whether or not the patient is at risk for further or future problems related to their use. And then obviously the, the laboratory determinants are things like breathalyzers, urine screens, uh, saliva swabs, uh, all these different ways that we can use scientific evidence to help uh, assess the level of the problem or lack thereof. Sometimes it's a rule out, you know, sometimes that lab can be, that lab result can be uh, really a, a way to empower or exonerate the patient if, uh, if they're trying to build trust and prove to those around them that they are making changes. Um, again, we're going to kind of continue to build on this content of, of problem assessment, looking at the signs and symptoms of uh, one's substance use. Uh, we know in, in uh, DSM-5, uh, on page 40 or 490 and 491, there's the big 11, I call them. Those are those 11 substance use disorder criterion that really uh, are how we determine uh, the, the, the level or severity uh, of a person's substance use disorder diagnostically. Um, so, but these big 11 make up that the DSM criteria. I think in the TR, the TR has just recently come out this year. I think those pages are, are different, numbers are different now. But in the DSM-5, it's located on those, those two pages specifically. Um, and then you can also look at any self-report uh, answers on questionnaires. Uh, sometimes if there's been a screener or uh, an information gathering um, portion uh, of the pre-assessment, there may be some self-reported information that you can look at. But cross-referencing self-reports with collateral reports, uh, for example, you know, public record, I can go on to public record and view a patient's legal history. Um, it's there, it's public record. So I can use that as a collateral means to, to cross-reference or cross-check the self-reports. It's, it really, uh, it allows us to make more uh, accurate, uh, gather and have a more accurate clinical picture of the patient's overall uh, substance use and how it's impacted them. But then, and then again, using those 11 criteria to determine uh, the substance use disorder severity is also important. We're gonna to touch on that in a minute. Again, having a pretty good working understanding uh, of um, what constitutes a drink, uh, or drinks. Uh, this, this has been pretty standard information, so I suspect you've all seen a, a variation of this. Uh, but remember, you know, the amounts uh, consumed do matter. Uh, one drink uh, is not a, a large uh, bottle or, uh, you know, a tall boy. Uh, I remember I had a patient that told me they had one drink a day, and uh, they were they were clearly uh, having experiencing some withdrawal and some reporting some tolerance. And later in our interview, it, it turned out that that one drink was about a 20 ounce uh, glass of liquor that was being consumed, um, you know, and it may have even been larger than that. Uh, but that to them, to the patient, that was one drink. It was just a very large drink. So it was outside of the standards uh, that you see before you. Uh, again, uh, looking at uh, this, this understanding the, the severity or the details around the, 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 the problem or the issue related to the use, um, <clears throat> looking at different uh, use of different screeners, uh, alcohol use inventory, uh, there you see the addiction severity index. Um, different agencies have different screeners. Uh, there are some that are keyed on mental health, uh, some that are keyed on depression, and some that focus on alcohol and uh, drug use. So uh, I know we use the audit quite a bit at our uh, clinic and uh, use the PHQ-9 and the modified mini to assess mental health conditions. But uh, each agency, I'm sure you guys can list off several screeners that you all are using or are familiar with. 
Um, also looking at um, different components. So usually in a good assessment, you know, we call it a comprehensive assessment because it, it really touches on all of these areas that you see listed here. Uh, it's not just about the use, but it's it's also this under this umbrella. And I like to think of it or, you know, sort of imagine it as this biopsychosocial umbrella that sort of covers all of this, all areas. You know, you could you could even relate it to the medicine wheel or uh, connect it in that way that it's it's really all encompassing. It's holistic. It uh, we really have to look at um, all parts of the patient's lives to to get a really clear, comprehensive picture of how their substance use is affecting them or affecting other life areas. Yes, I'm, I'm reading uh, Danielle's points here. Yes, I, thank you so much, you guys. This is great. Uh, yeah, Leslie, I, you know, I think there's some information you can gather um, that you don't need consents for. As I, as I mentioned, you know, accessing public records like arrest records or arrest blotter, daily arrest, daily jail blotters were are accessible, their patient uh, or their uh, public record. So I can access that. Um, <clears throat> but there might, to share information, you obviously need consents. Um, but if I'm gathering information from the patient um, and I would like to check it out with a you know a parent or guardian or family member, yeah, obviously I can't just reach out to them. Um, sometimes I would have uh, a parent or a guardian or a family member call me they would call the clinic and uh, they would say, uh, my spouse or my brother or my son is coming down to do an evaluation today. There's some things I think you should know. Now, I can't confirm or deny that that patient, uh, that I'm seeing that patient or that they're coming in that day, but I can certainly listen. I can listen to what that parent or guardian or family member has to say. And then I can take that information and if I can identify that with the patient that's receiving services, I can use it internally as a collateral means uh, of information. I can say to the patient, gosh, I got a call from your mom, you know, earlier today. She told me you were coming in. Now, I didn't tell her that you were here, or that I knew you, but this is what she shared with me. I I've done this before. I um, hope that makes sense. Let's let's keep going. Um, like I said, we've got quite a few slides. I want to try and push through here. Again, uh, I, I'm really emphasizing this this information gathering process. Um, that that list we saw previously just it just continues on here. We're going to look at if we can a good assessment is going to have uh, these may be grouped in certain categories, but it's really going to give me a chance to, to at least uh, touch on or have the patient uh, disclose information uh, regarding their overall, the overall impact of their substance use and how it's impacted their lives. Um, you know, just, just trying to understand where they're coming from. Um, what's their community like? Uh, what's their support like? Um, Trying to gather information to understand, you know, for example, cognitive function. Um, is there, uh, you know, are there issues related to memory or uh, language or some other uh, neurocognitive functioning that's being that's been impacted by their substance use? These are all things that we're going to try and at least get an understanding of if they're present. Um, so, just an overview of the assessment process. It's really, the, if you can break it down into sort of these six categories, just for your own uh, conceptualization, detection, classification, uh, functional assessment, functional analysis, treatment planning, and recovery, recovery capital. And think of recovery, recovery capital as a sort of support network. Um, think, of, think of it as uh, one of the things that I would often ask patients is, have you had a time in the past where you've been able to maintain uh, some period of recovery or abstinence? 
And if the answer is yes, uh, you know, I would explore with them what they were doing then to have success. This could be categorized as assessing their recovery capital. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Yeah, Tracy's asking, is there uh, information about uh, drugs, uh, potency and amount of uh, substance use used severity? Yeah, there's there's quite a bit of information out there. It's, it's good to have uh, some uh, sense of especially what's what's trending now, especially with a lot of the opioids and uh, a lot of the uh, concerns related to fentanyl. Uh, it's important to understand uh, these, these drugs that our patients are being uh, impacted by. Uh, but there's a lot of information out there, Tracy, and I think you uh, can rely on colleagues or um, you know, looking at a lot of the information that's uh, available uh, online or through different resources. But having a good working understanding of that is important, especially if you're in this line of work. It's part of your livelihood. And uh, knowing really the, the big three for me are uh, alcohol, cannabis, and stimulants. I better have a good working understanding of those. Um, alcohol uh, impacts and uh, kills more people than all the other drugs combined. And um, so it, it's, its impact on our patients are extensive. Uh, it impacts different ethnic groups uh, more so. Uh, so it's it's really important to have a good working understanding. Um, so again, I, I think uh, <clears throat> recovery capital, again, is the depth and breadth of internal and external resources that can be used to someone, uh, be used by someone to begin or continue their uh, recovery process. Um, I'm going to keep moving though, just because we're, we don't have as much time as I would like uh, to get through a lot of this information. Okay, here we go. Quiz question number two. What is the most common form of drug screening test performed in the substance abuse treatment uh, field? What do we think? Those are your choices. I don't have A, B, or C here. So uh, I think this was a polling question at one point. Uh, so what do we think? Uh, yeah, what's the most common? Yeah, there we go. Gwen, Gwen has hit it. Yes. Cynthia, urine. Yes, it is. I, as a clinician for 23 years, I worked in the clinical setting. I can say without a doubt that I have collected gallons of urine throughout my career. So thank you. That's not something you get to say very often out loud and have people sort of, you know, respect you for that, but it's true, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the urine screens are absolutely vital. I can't imagine doing accurate, responsible assessments without some form of screening. And uh, uh, BACs, or the, the breathalyzer, and urine analysis are uh, extremely uh, important. Yes, yes, thank you, Richard. I appreciate you uh, appreciating my my humor. I my all my old urine jokes. You know, I won't go into them. We don't have time, but uh, yes, um, absolutely important. And mo the most popular means is the urine screen. Uh, let's take a look at um, detection. Uh, we're looking now at those under those six sort of uh, parts of assessment. Identifying patient uh, patients with potential problems. So understanding and detecting that. Uh, past and current use of alcohol, tobacco, or other substances. Uh, lab tests to screen for uh, presence of uh, substance and the negative consequences connected to their use. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, there are some observable uh, indicators as well. You know, are they having difficulty concentrating? Are they visibly shaky? Uh, looking at this, um, especially if the patient is in early parts of their withdrawal um, or have very high levels of um, intake, and as they begin to sober, they are at much higher risk for um, life threatening withdrawal consequences. Um, so using your senses, you know, can I, can I smell or see or 
um, you know, hear anything that is tipping me off. So I'm, I'm trying to also use my own observable senses to, to see this. I've sat with a patient who uh, I later found out was blowing high, uh, mid threes on the, the breathalyzer, but we were having a conversation just like this. And she was absolutely lucid and very calm. And, but she had a BAC uh, over three and was having a conversation with me like it was like it was nothing. So you can't always rely on visuals, but uh, without the BAC, I may have not you know, known. I think I did eventually smell something, but uh, we had a secretary at the clinic that could smell alcohol in someone's breath from at least 20 feet away. I was always amazed. I, I used to say, Annette, you need to, uh, you know, somehow patent that and uh, your services could be used in a lot of ways. So. Um, let's look at classification. I, I want to talk about this. It's, it's absolutely important. Classification using the DSM is really uh, a way for me to be objective and follow this diagnostic criterion. Um, I'm going to look at uh, whether there's presence of a DSM-5 diagnosis. I'm going to look at that 12-month period uh, where these criterion were present. Um, I generally would focus on the, the most recent or previous 12 months, but that doesn't mean I couldn't look at another 12 month period in the patient's lives. But as we know, DSM says these criterion uh, are uh, present within a 12 month period. Uh, but I'm gonna look maybe at their, their most difficult times but I'm also going to look at currently where they're at in this past 12 months using multiple sources of information. We've talked about that, 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 uh, that collateral information, but also in your assessment tools, uh, using ASAM criteria, using DSM-5 or other screening uh, implements. Um, and as I said, you know, I can't stress it enough, collateral information can, is really the key to making those informed, accurate, and objective uh, uh, diagnoses moving, moving forward. Functional assessment. So looking at uh, um, you know, obtaining this information, you're gathering information, using collateral uh, uh, sources, um, assessing the patient's uh, various needs, identifying their strengths, identifying their support system. You know, absolutely vital uh, to understand what world they're living in and understand what, what their support is like uh, or, or where it lacks. Uh, and identifying, again, uh, it's connected closely to that recovery capital that we've been talking about. Uh, but the strengths um, can be uh, of use to get, uh, to, to get the uh, help keep that patient on track or engage or uh, begin to uh, consider making some, some changes. Um, Culture can be seen as a strength. Uh, family, uh, we know the more engaged someone is in their family or in their community or in their culture, the less likely it is that they would have extensive issues related to their substance use, and they're more likely to find support and assistance as they move forward in their early recovery. Functional analysis, again, identifying factors that uh, sort of perpetuate the substance use, um, uh, explore possible um, reasons or, or motives behind that. Um, remember, uh, and, and I hope this makes sense to you guys that are listening, and you've heard me say this before, a patient's substance use is not the problem. A patient's substance use is not the problem. It's causing them problems. But it really is, I believe, a symptom or a sign that there's some other underlying factors. So this functional analysis may allow you to look at some of those underlying or what we would call co-occurring or comorbid issues. Um, looking at and identifying those motives and, um, and, and the, the costs associated with those. Um, and you're really sometimes just formulating hypotheses. You're, you're not certain yet. 
um, sometimes you're trying to predict and understand. It's like putting a, a jigsaw puzzle piece together. Sometimes you may not have or see the full picture until you have more pieces of that puzzle. Um, so again, um, these are things to consider as we move through this crucial assessment process. Uh, so let's look at some methods of obtaining assessment information. Clearly, we know the face-to-face -face interaction, and now there's you know there's a real movement towards telehealth which can be face-to-face -face in, in a video monitor like we're doing today. Uh, but, you know, traditional face-to-face -face interviewing is, is one of the most, still one of the most accessible and, and uh, reliable means to, to gathering information. Uh, there's a semi-structured interview and there's a structured interview. Um, you know, semi-structured interviews usually uh, um, involve some open-ended questions and really it requires a more uh, experienced clinician to do semi-structured interview. Structured interviews are more like your screeners, your short answer questions. Uh, they're very, very straightforward. Their intentions are very clear. Um, obviously, there's, you know, still uh, handwritten um, evaluations. Those are really becoming like dinosaurs, uh, fewer and fewer between most assessments now are all done electronically through electronic health record systems and they're linked directly into the diagnostic and treatment planning components of a patient's uh, chart or file. So, um, <clears throat> but still, you're still, the information gathering, however, whatever medium you're using, it's still, you're still gathering comprehensive, holistic information to help reach the best um, course of action for the patient that's coming in to see you. Um, obviously, face-to-face -face allows you to utilize micro-counseling skills and look at verbal and nonverbal, um, and it really helps, it may help you uh, uh, fill in some of those, those puzzle pieces that we talked about earlier. Um, let's look at some assessment tools briefly. Again, I, I'm not going to go through these, but um, there's the ASI. Uh, addiction severity index. I know this is connected uh, and can be used as a primary assessment tool. I think AccuCare use, utilizes this in uh, a lot of the uh, tribal agencies. Um, and I think it, it's utilized in other, um, with other entities as well uh, outside of um, uh, tribal entities or systems of care. Um, <clears throat> There's, there's just, and again, I'm not going to go through these, but there's the comprehensive drinking profile. Um, this, this timeline or follow back, uh, the, the TLFB, um, again, this, this is a way uh, for you to utilizing, I think, I think the technique is you utilize a calendar and have them connect significant events with uh, sort of their history. Uh, sometimes patients either selectively or for reasons other than, than that, uh, cognitive deficiencies will have some temporal issues on uh, connecting um, you know, past events to their substance use. So this, this timeline follow back, um, uh, we used to use timelines uh, as an exercise in some of our therapy groups uh, where a person would use a timeline to sort of explain how to, to their peers, how they got to where they are now. Um, it can be uh, significant. It can be similar to using like a uh, family tree exercise or something of that nature. Uh, there's also the inventory of uh, drinking situations. Again, I'm not as familiar with this, but you can see it really is trying to look at uh, specifically these eight different categories related to one's alcohol use. Uh, the situational competence questionnaire. Uh, again, I think this is uh, maybe like a relapse prevention assessment tool. Uh, how likely it is that they would? Uh, yeah, Nora says she uses the, the timeline on the on the medicine bill. Yeah, perfect. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, the SASE is another popular uh, means to to sort of. In theory, it's supposed to be able to determine whether or not the patient is being forthcoming uh, or, or, or misleading the, the uh, interviewer uh, in some way. Uh, I, we did not use the SASE at our, our clinic, uh, but I, I knew other clinics that did implement or utilize this, this particular uh, substance use uh, screener. 
Uh, the global appraisal of individual needs, the, the gain assessment, if anyone's ever tried to do a gain assessment, a full gain, uh, it's extremely comprehensive and uh, really covers, uh, it leaves no stone unturned, let me just say that. Uh, there's a brief gain, uh, a reduced gain that uh, uh, is a little more palatable, but uh, the full gain can be, uh, it can be a two plus hour interview depending on patient's history and ability to articulate uh, their, their own um, situation and issues. Let's take a look at DSM-5. Now, I, you know, I'm going to assume most of you on the call today, we've got about 50 of us on the call today. I'm going to assume that many of you uh, are familiar with DSM-5. At some point, I'll, uh, I will reference and add a couple slides about the TR that came out this year. They, they did make some slight changes, but uh, overall, uh, uh, the DSM-5 uh, TR is pretty much the same as far as uh, clinical or di diagnosis, diagnos diagnostic uh, components. They've added quite a bit uh, regarding cultural considerations, which is a, a really a uh, step in the right direction, and they continue to reduce stigmatizing language. Uh, but if anybody's interested, I do have a link that uh, you can go and check those changes out to yourself. Um, and I know the DSM-5-TR is also available uh, for purchase, um, and uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing to have uh, around if you're doing this kind of work. Here are the 10 different substance-related um, um, disorders or, or categories uh, of substances. Uh, it's important to know these. Um, I'm sure you already do. <clears throat> Here we go. Quiz question three. How many diagnostic criterion are listed in the DSM-5 in the section for substance use disorders? This is like low-hanging fruit. You guys have got this. This is, I set you up for this. I want to set you guys up to succeed. How many? Yes, Rich. Richard, uh, the big 11, we know this. Um, those are important to understand and we see them listed in any good assessment as you work through that and try and determine how many of those criteria in your patient is meeting. The big 11, and again, um, I think just some important notes on the side. Um, Almost all substance-related disorders in DSM-5 include um, intoxication and withdrawal, um, and all of them um, include some type of disorder. Um, there are some, uh, some specific substances um, that, that are the exception to this, but almost all specify that the substance use be uh, rated as mild, moderate, and severe. Remember, we've moved away from abuse and dependence, and now the vernacular in DSM-5 and, and in our field is mild, moderate, and severe. There are some exceptions. Uh, caffeine, hallucinogens, inhalants, and tobacco. Uh, for example, caffeine use disorders, there are no severity ratings, Although I'm pretty sure I am caffeine use disorder severe, I'll just make that diagnosis of myself right now. Uh, anyone want to join me on that uh, diagnosis? Uh, please, uh, I, I, it's, it's lonely here. So, um, but you can see there are some others. There's no specific evidence of intoxication or withdrawal related to uh, hallucinogens disorder. There are no... Uh, uh, there's no intoxication specifier for inhalant use disorder and no intoxication specifier for uh, the use of tobacco. Yeah, let's see. Uh, yes, thank you, Matilda. You, you and I, uh, caffeine use disorder severe. Even though there isn't a specifier, uh, we can still claim that one. <clears throat> uh, alcohol use disorders, again, uh, you know, this, this one, uh, we know alcohol use disorders uh, are uh, prevalent. Uh, they are everywhere. And we'll see that in, uh, you know, seven out of 10 patients that we serve and see there'll be some something related to the use of alcohol. Um, remember, as a reminder, uh, the terms abuse and dependence have been eliminated. They, they're not in DSM-5. Uh, we're talking mild, moderate, and severe. 
alcohol intoxication withdrawal and unspecified alcohol related disorder, which really replaces the old, remember the not otherwise specified, the NOS. Uh, this really is reserved for patients who, as a clinician, you may have some concerns related to their alcohol use that are not categorized or identified on those big 11, but there are still some, some issues that you're concerned about. It could be uh, an elevated uh, BAC at the time of arrest or an accident or injury involved in their arrest or events that led to their admi uh, admission into your facility. Um, <clears throat> but, it's, but you can't categorize it or identify it as a mild, moderate, or severe use disorder. It can be a great diagnosis to use as a foothold when you have some collateral information or information that cannot be uh, categorized in those big 11. I hope that makes sense. Let's do a quiz. If a patient has a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder moderate, how many DSM-5 criterion would they need to currently meet? Moderate alcohol use disorder. According to DSM-5, Richard says B. You are correct, sir. We know, and many of you know out there that this is uh, this is the the, uh, the the amount you need four to five of those eleven criterion being met within a twelve month period. And again, often I look at the the previous twelve months uh, leading up to their their uh, service with me or their engagement with me. Uh, but at least four uh, or five. If there's six or more, it's a it's a severe it's a severe uh, alcohol use disorder as most as most of you will probably know. So again, um, there there's that uh, you know that that sort of breakdown of the mild, moderate, and severe um, uh, ratings. Just you, you all should know those. And if you're just new to the field or or learning, this is this is the nuts and bolts of making a substance use disorder diagnosis as a uh, clinician in this particular field. Um, and we know that that's part of the, that's based on those 11 criteria uh, present in the DSM-5 and 5TR. <clears throat> and alcohol use disorder is defined as a problematic pattern of alcohol, alcohol use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by, and then there's our there's our, uh, you know, at least two of 11 and within a 12 month period, um, you know, it could be a past 12 month period, but I, I really believe that best practice is to look at the, the previous 12 months leading up to their engagement with you. Uh, we don't have to go through these, um, you know, verbatim, but I, I just want you to be aware uh, of them. And the, in the red are, are sort of examples of, what you might look for. What I will say about these criterion is you're looking for, if you see words like recurrent or um, uh, plural efforts, it has to be this pattern. It cannot be a one-time thing. Um, the fourth criterion craving is new to DSM-5. Uh, it was replaced by recurrent um, legal problems that were alcohol or drug related. It was thought that uh, this was uh, culturally biased and uh, was removed and replaced with cravings. But there in five, you see the word recurrent. Um, we see in six, the, the word continued. Um, in seven, you know, it's talking about those social or recreational or, or occupational activities activities uh, that are given up or reduced, recurrent use of alcohol in situations that are physically hazardous. What's probably the most common one there? Well, we'd be drinking and driving, right? I mean, that's we had a specific question uh, that asked in a very um, non-threatening way, you know, how many times have you driven in the past 12 months when you knew you probably had too much to drink, but you drove anyway? Uh, something to that effect. Uh, trying to gather information in a way that may not be completely obvious, but 
we're looking for that criterion eight with that question. Uh, alcohol use has continued um, despite having that persistent or recurrent physical or psychological issue that's made worse by drinking. This could be, you know, drinking on top of medications. It could be drinking despite, uh, uh, you know, already having a, a physical limitation that uh, would make you more prone to, you know, re-injuring yourself. Um, you know, I, I have lots of examples that I could share, but just for time purposes, uh, number nine uh, is a symptom that I would uh, encourage you to, to really look holistically at on that biopsychosocial sort of scale. And then, of course, uh, you know, 10 and 11. And here, you know, here we've got, I know it there really should be 10 and 11. I don't know how we got, we, there aren't 13. Um, I think those should be A and and A on the, underneath those, but um, tolerance and withdrawal, you know, obviously uh, these, we're going to look for these in a number of ways. Um, we're going to look at that as far as their frequency and amount of use, uh, and then whether or not there are symptoms present that would indicate uh, withdrawal or history of with withdrawal that might warrant uh, immediate medical um, intervention. Uh, we all know that withdrawal from alcohol and uh, another drug class uh, under the uh, sedative hypnotic uh, category, benzodiazepines, uh, are life-threatening. So we have to be really careful about um, about patients that are reporting heavy use of either of those drugs. They're at risk for uh, life-threatening withdrawal. Um, and, and ironically enough, you know, the, the medical field and, and in many detox centers, we use a particular type of benzodiazepine to help the body recalibrate as it's withdrawing from alcohol. So there's a little bit of a irony in that in that as well. So I want to look also at uh, specifiers. Um, I was really happy to see in five, they really simplified this because I used to get these confused all the time. Um, they really took in five, it, it, it's either you're in an early remission or a sustained remission. There's no partial or early full, or it's just early or sustained. Early remission means that the patient is not meeting any of the substance use disorder criterion that they may have previously met for at least three months, but, but less than 12. If they are not meeting any of that substance use disorder criterion for 12 months or more, then, then we would say they are in a sustained remission. So I would add that specifier, right? I would say alcohol use disorder, uh, sustained remission. And, and it, it's a way to let the reader know that this patient is stable and is no longer meeting criteria, but at one point they did in the past. So it might help uh, the reader or the clinician through the referral understand why this patient is currently in a continuing care setting as opposed to a primary care setting. So I hope that makes, makes sense to everyone. I'm kind of zipping through these because I want to make sure we touch on them. Quiz five, quiz question five, which of the following substances can cause life-threatening physical withdrawal symptoms. Which of the following substances? Let's see what we have here. I'm, I'm trying to trick you guys. Did I get anybody? Dorothy says, um, Dorothy says D. We have a B. We okay, I, I might have gotten you guys on this one. Okay. Here we go. This is a great teaching moment here. So the correct answer, the correct answer is when we're talking about physical, uh, life-threatening physical withdrawal symptoms, the correct answer is A and C. So the correct answer is D. Now, now some of you might say, well, opioids, you know, those withdrawal symptoms are extremely, uh, you know, difficult. Yes, they are. But withdrawal from opioids is not life-threatening. The patient may feel like they're going to die. They may have all kinds of physical and uh, complicating factors, you know, diarrhea, uh, uh, flu-like symptoms, um, 
you know, extreme physiological condition, agitated, uh, you know, paranoid, uh, restless, lack of appetite, etc. But they will not die. Alcohol, on the other hand, if I don't treat someone who's in physical withdrawal from alcohol, they go into shock and they can pass. Same with benzos. There's a high risk for seizure uh, and there can be ir ir irreparable uh, complications that can cause death. Opioids, on the other hand, can be managed. Uh, you make the patient comfortable, maybe prescribe some clonidine or something to keep them comfortable until you can get them on uh, maybe a, uh, a taper of some kind through uh, methadone or uh, buprenorphine or something. Um, so that's just, just something to note. Let's talk a little bit about ROSC. Um, I, you know, I, I think that this, uh, this approach is becoming more and more part of how the way we address and engage with patients. It's really looking at uh, a multitude of uh, levels uh, in addressing patient needs. And um, we, so we, we focus less, less on the pathology of the patient and more on their wellness. We uh, not only focus on the recovery from substance use disorders, but also on the recovery of a meaningful life in their community and within their families. Uh, this really is at the heart of what, you know, what's happening, this shift from, um, you know, from this, <clears throat> how do we get the patient into treatment to how do we support the process of recovery within the person's environment. I don't know if some of you may be familiar with ROSC, but it's, you know, it really is this holistic approach that's multifaceted. Let's, let me ask you this. Here's a quiz question. Which, I should say, of the following, not if, which of the following is not a key component of the ROSC approach? Which is not a key component? Polling questions are a little more exciting because we watch the polls come in, but uh, but yes, yes. Uh, a, a is the correct answer. Um, you know, we, we know about working in silos and, um, you know, sometimes we get trapped in our own little uh, service silo and ROSC sort of just tries to break those barriers down and have us all work collectively together. There obviously can still be some complications to that, especially with substance use disorders. We need to make sure we have releases and consents and are able to share and collaborate with other providers uh, without violating a patient's uh, privacy or confidentiality. So again, uh, looking at ROSC, uh, the treatment agencies are considered one of the many resources for the patient. No one resource is more important than the other and various support systems need to work together very closely with the patient. We see one of the bridges uh, to this, I believe is you know, the peer recovery coaching or peer recovery uh, support specialist. Uh, these have really come back around in the last decade and, and become more and more part of uh, this, these systems of care. Uh, that's a great bridge to connecting uh, the, the, the facility to the community and helping the patient do that through uh, connecting with the recovery, pro-recovery resources in the community. Again, this is just sort of a, a, a visual, um, the ROSC support uh, person-centered and self-directed approaches to care that build on the personal responsibility, strengths and resilience of individuals, families and communities to really enhance the quality of the recovery. And we see this really moving on happening. Uh, again, more visuals on this. Uh, Yes, I, I agree, Richard. Um, uh, yeah, Richard says this seems to be a, a, a more broader look at what the treatment team involves. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, it's really breaking down some of those silos. And, you know, they used to say, you well, you treat the mental health first and then the substance use, or you treat the substance use first and then sort of, you know, concurrently or, or subsequently you treat the, the, the mental health disorder, uh, really now it's saying, you know, you, you really address all of these issues simultaneously. And, 
And that really fits well with this ROSC model. It's just trying to, uh, to have this diverse biopsychosocial multifaceted uh, component uh, involved in one's recovery. Again, just some bullet points. We don't need to go through these uh, verbatim, but just to give you an idea, um, person-centered and self-directed, um, comprehensive, it's strength-based, and it's really, it's about meeting the patient where they're at and, uh, and not trying to push them through uh, and have their completion of the program, you know, driven by the program requirements. It's rather, it's really based on patient progress and patient need. Again, just some other bullet points about uh, the ROSC uh, system uh, or this ROSC approach to, to treatment. Again, uh, you know, we'll make these slides available so that you can uh, review them if you would like when we have a little more time. But I, I wanted just to include these because uh, your agency may already be using elements of this ROSC system. I think there's a couple other acronyms I've heard it referred to as. But I wanted to just give you some exposure to this idea of treating the patient uh, in this multifaceted way. Uh, and breaking down those service silos that we, you know, so often see uh, in in uh, in the treatment programs that we provide. Let's take a quick look at. Oh boy, yeah, we're going to run out of time. Let's take a quick look at ASAM um, again. And I, you know, I may have to consider doing uh, doing this in two sections, or at least giving myself a couple of hours to get through these. But let's look at ASAM. How many of you? Um, uh, you can just give give me a show of hands. How many of you are using ASAM in your assessment process or in your your treatment uh, uh, continuum? How many are using ASAM? ASAM, the risk ratings. Uh, just do, use your hand raise feature, so I can get kind of a quick glance here. All right, Catherine's got her hand going. Yes, Tracy. So there may be a few others. Um, I know that hand raise feature can be elusive to, to punch the button on, but, uh, but yes, it looks like Richard is. Um, yeah. So if you're not, and some agencies don't require it, uh, right now, I think about 35 states uh, require um, the use of ASAM through third-party payers. Uh, and really, uh, I want you to think of ASAM uh, as a supplement to your primary assessment tool. So it can be uh, an additional way to help guide the clinician uh, from, from assessment all the way through to discharge. And it really helps monitor and track the patient's uh, progress or lack thereof. It can help determine level of care. It can help determine necessity of need. And it's really a wonderful tool. It's, it's like having a, a universal clinical language based on these zero to four risk ratings in these six uh, um, dimensions, these six life dimensions. We're going we're gonna to take a peek at these real quick. So if you're not familiar with these and want some more information, please email me. I've got a lot of information on this. We use this extensively at our clinic. And uh, it was just a really great way to have that element of consistency and uh, professionalism and accuracy so that we were making uh, diagnoses and uh, decisions that were consistent across the board. Let's take a look. What do you guys think? Uh, first quiz question right out of the gates. What does ASAM stand for? Let's see who, who gets the $65 prize. And Dorothy comes in. Dorothy comes in with C, and C is the correct answer. The American Society of Addiction Medicine. It's been around for several decades. It, it's, its name has changed a little bit here and there, but it's been, uh, it's been ASAM criterion for uh, at least the last, gosh, 30 years, I think. Uh, if somebody has um, contrary information, please give me a shout. We can, we can correct that. But uh, yes, the American Society for Addiction Medicine. Uh, yeah, around since 81, there were some earlier forms of it um, before then, but um, 
it really uh, it really is uh, uh, this standardized set of criteria that, that's a supplement to your primary assessment tool that is really uh, patient focused and allows for you to monitor progress of the patient based on a zero to four risk rating in these six dimensions that we're going to take a quick look at. Uh, also, to note, there is a fourth edition. Now, right now, it's been third edition for a while. There's a fourth edition that's going to be out in 2023. Um, so keep an eye open for, for that. Uh, the goal of ASAM criterion, it, as I mentioned, it's to unify the addiction field around a single set of criteria. And, and here, you know, here are just, uh, just a quick glance at the different levels of care. We uh, probably are all familiar with these. Um, as we use these, you know, these to help uh, place our, our patients in the best possible, least restrictive uh, uh, level of care based on their needs. Here are the key six dimensions to ASAM criteria. And I, you know, I could spend an, an entire afternoon uh, going through these with you guys, but I want you to at least have an idea of what they look like. Uh, dimensions one through six. Think of this <clears throat> on this biopsychosocial scale. Remember, we talked about an assessment being holistic and really covering all aspects, whether you lay the medicine wheel over that or whether you look at it under this biopsychosocial sort of umbrella. It's covering all aspects of a person's being. These are the six dimensions and how they're broken down. So here we go. <clears throat> Which ASAM dimension is associated with determining a, determining a patient's willingness to engage in the treatment process? Which ASAM dimension? Let me see if we go back. And there. What do we think? Yes, dimension four, assessing the patient's readiness to change on this zero to four uh, risk rating scale. Zero being willingly engaged in treatment services and four being uh, non-compliant and uh, unwilling to engage. <clears throat> so again, um, I talked about this risk rating scale. There they are, zero to four A, B. Uh, but let's just think about zero to four right now. Um, they really uh, are allow you to uh, use that risk rating to help the your staff. If you have a multidisciplinary team, and you all understand what a risk rating of zero would mean in a certain dimension or a risk rating of three or whatever it may be. Uh, a rating of zero, for example, may indicate there are no concerns or that there was a concern, but it's now stable. Each dimension that we looked at uh, garners a risk rating uh, at the time of the patient's admission, or placement, admission, uh, continued stay, and discharge. <clears throat> when you're assessing, assessing, um, or assigning a risk rating in each of the dimensions, some things to remember. Um, the definition for the assigned risk rating may not match word for word, but you focus on selecting the risk rating that most accurately reflects the patient's condition at that time. So you, I really emphasize that you look at assigning the risk rating for what's happening with the patient at that time. And we would see those risk ratings fluctuate, right? We would hope that if a patient came into an intensive outpatient service with elevated risk ratings of twos and threes, that as they engaged and stabilized, that we would see those risk ratings reduce, hence allowing us to perhaps complete their primary care and step them down into an outpatient uh, continuing care setting. You can use those ASAM criteria to justify a decrease in level of care or an increase in level of care. Somebody in an entry-level outpatient setting, for example, they may continue to struggle. We see their ASAM risk ratings elevate in some of the dimensions. This may allow us to staff this patient. And I call up the insurance agency and I say, uh, we are recommending this patient be transferred into uh, a residential facility, that that insurance 
provider may say, what are those ASAM risk ratings that justify that? They may ask you straight up what that, what that is. There are also separate risk ratings in dimensions four, five, and six that tease out mental health disorders and substance use disorders. And the key for the clinician in these uh, dimensions, four, five, and six, is to look at the risk ratings in each of these subcategories and try and determine how those interact. Is the patient, patient's mental health condition interfering with their treatment engagement or vice versa? I know I'm going over these very quickly, but uh, those of you that are familiar with ASAM uh, are gonna maybe be able to understand this a little bit better. Um, again, we're not gonna have time to go through these, but I, I wanted to give you kind of an idea of some of the wording, for example, uh, in uh, that first dimension, acute intoxication and withdrawal. So you're gonna determine uh, based on a zero to four risk rating, where that patient is at the time that you're seeing them. This could be in a, a, an intake or a, a, an assessment uh, interview. You're gonna assign risk ratings based on the information you have at that time. So if I sit down with Richard, he's in my eval with me and he's reporting very uh, low use history or very low frequency and amount, uh, reports no tolerance or no signs or symptoms of withdrawal, then I'm going to assign him a risk rating of zero. The patient is fully functioning and demonstrates good ability to tolerate and cope with withdrawal discomfort, or no signs or symptoms of intoxication or withdrawal are present. Uh, that's a risk rating of zero. And you can see that these escalate as we move through all the way down to a risk rating of four, which would say the patient is incapacitated with severe signs and symptoms Severe withdrawal present uh, presents danger such as seizures. Continued use poses an imminent threat to life. That's a big shift. So if I was with Richard and he was in full withdrawal, uh, having DTs, and then I would immediate that would immediately allow me to say he needs three seven right now. We've got to get him into detox right now. When I and when the nurse calls to pre-cert that service, they're going to say Richard's a four. On, uh, re, uh, on acute intoxication or withdrawal. And then we're gonna have that pre-cert uh, granted right then and there. Again, we're not gonna have time to go through all these, but I have examples of how each dimension and each sort of definition for the risk rating is assigned. So each dimension has the zero to four uh, risk ratings uh, assigned to them. Each has sort of a, a contextual definition of how that risk rating applies to that dimension. So that's just, just to give you an idea of how that looks. Uh, you can see uh, zero to four, we move through. Uh, the biomedical are usually related to things like uh, pre-existing medical condition. It could be a current injury, an open wound, uh, untreated diabetes. It could be a number of things. Uh, the point is, is that I'm trying to assess at that time what risk rating best matches where the patient is at at the time that I'm seeing them. So again, uh, each dimension, one through six, I'm just showing you sort of what that looks like. Um, and again, you can look at these a little closer if you'd like. Uh, and there's a lot of information out there uh, about ASAM. I can send you some examples, uh, some handouts and things we use when we do ASAM trainings. But um, again, I'm going to just kind of zip through these uh, risk ratings associated with each dimension. Here we go. Even though I zipped through those slides quickly, true or false, ASAM's six dimensions and the zero to four risk rating system are designed as a standalone assessment tool to guide the clinician in determining diagnosis and course of treatment. True or false? Yes, you guys got it. It's false. It's a supplement. It really is designed to interface with your primary assessment tool and give that assessment a little more teeth uh, from, from assessment uh, and placement all the way through to discharge. Again, uh, I just I want you to understand and just have at least some working knowledge of what uh, levels the what levels of care uh, we we have along this continuum. We know uh, this 0.5 early intervention service 
Um, we often see this with young adults or with adolescents. Uh, it's a it's a psychoeducational, so there's a therapeutic component, but it's primarily uh, an educational based in uh, treatment engagement. It's someone that may not be meeting diagnoses for uh, substance use disorder, but has a lot of risk factors that indicate they may be at risk. Uh, it's a great way to engage them in a non-threatening uh, manner and provide some direct education with a therapeutic sort of uh, flavor to it. Again, level one uh, therapies include uh, uh, educational groups, could be psychotherapy, it could be uh, uh, any number of different uh, uh, types of level one. But think of level one as kind of an entry level uh, outpatient. It usually involves individual or group sessions. Uh, it's entry level. It's for someone maybe meeting a mild substance use disorder uh, that is not, has not advanced through or is not having significant problems related to their substance use at the time that they were assessed. Again, um, this, this really was to give you, if we had a little more time, I'd spend a little more time talking with you about this, but this really is just to give you an idea of how we use ASAM criterion to determine best level of care. So again, um, you know, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to just, I'm going to move through these slides, but what you would see, uh, the, the examples here are what you, risk ratings you might see for someone in a level one, an entry level outpatient service. You can see the risk ratings in one and two are likely going to be zero. So they're stable or at no risk. Uh, dimension three, the cognitive behavioral condition, you might see risk ratings from zero to two. And this again is for level one outpatient services. Again, dimension four, their readiness to change. Uh, this could fluctuate. I could make a case for, you know, maybe even a three, but you're likely going to see zero ones or twos in those risk ratings for an entry level outpatient, uh, um, you know, individual who's, who has presented this information at the time of their assessment. Dimension five, uh, in other words, they're their relapse or continued use potential for an entry-level outpatient uh, experience or recommendation. If I'm recommending level one outpatient, uh, I should see risk ratings uh, of between zero and two in dimension five. And that, well, that holds the same true for dimension six, their recovery environment. Remember, dimension six is recovery environment. Uh, think of it as that recovery capital. Uh, that sort of in that same vein. Um, and then what I would do if we had more time is I would show you um, how these risk ratings at the time uh, when we're determining the, the appropriate level of care are going to go up a bit. So we don't have time, but you can see here, I want you to make note for a, uh, an intensive outpatient recommendation. I would expect their emotional cognitive behavioral condition their ratings to be, uh, you know, somewhere between a two or a three. Uh, I'm looking for, essentially, I'm looking for at least one risk rating of three to really help support a 2.1 or intensive outpatient treatment recommendation um, for that patient. And really, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to interface with my diagnostic information, my collateral information, and to help me formulate the best possible recommendation based on the information that we have. I hope that makes sense. I, um, and I'm going to get to this slide here. Here's a, a three, five to three, seven. So uh, a residential or, or detox um, criterion, you know, again, we can see those risk ratings uh, where it says RR, we're going to see elevations here at these higher levels of care. And it would make sense, right? Uh, I'm not sure this might be a typo here. This shouldn't be, uh, I'll have to go back and fix that. But but the, but the point is just kind of block out, there we go. And, and uh, you know, I may have been actually doing some dictation and it, uh, it, may, have, it may have recorded me <laughs> saying, there we go. Um, but, but think about these dimensions. Uh, remember, dimension one, acute intoxication and withdrawal. Dimension two, 
biomedical. We're talking now about what we might see in a patient who is presenting for a possible detox or residential recommendation. And you can see those, those I just did kind of abbreviated definitions, but you can see uh, how they, they uh, exponentially go up as the risk rating goes up. Those definitions become more and more severe attached to each risk rating. These are gonna help you uh, advocate for your patient. Even if they're uh, telling you they want that service, sometimes third-party payers or uh, uh, the, the, the program itself may need to have enough information to support that recommendation due to limited resources and limited bed space. So it's important to use ASAM as a way to advocate and support uh, your patient. Uh, that's, how, that's how I've always looked at it. Again, if we look here, we can see uh, dimensions five and six for a residential or detox admission. I'm looking for risk ratings of between two and four. My, and then, and then there's some more information about withdrawal management. Uh, we're not gonna have time to look at that, but, um, but again, uh, important, especially with a lot of the opioid uh, withdrawal management uh, services that have really become part of our, uh, our daily lives and uh, part of our profession more so than, than any time before. This is the slide I wanted to show you. Um, in general, ASAM risk rating, these are some risk rating guidelines that we utilized at, at the clinic that I was at. If I'm going to make a recommendation, uh, in addition to my diagnostic information, coupled with my collateral information, and, and uh, I'm going to use the ASAM risk ratings to help uh, support a recommendation, a particular level of care recommendation. So, for example, if I was recommending that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Richard again. If I was recommending Richard be uh, admitted into a detox uh, unit for a proper detox protocol before entering residential, I want to have collateral information to support that, laboratory results. I want to have diagnostic information, so alcohol use disorder severe. But I also want to have at least a risk rating of four in one of those six dimensions. And likely it's going to be in dimensions one or two, but it could show up in some of those other later dimensions as well. Uh, but, but I want to have at least a four A or B risk rating in one of those dimensions. That'll better arm me with the information I need to advocate for Richard to get detox services. I hope that makes sense, you guys. Um, again, um, the clinical evaluation assessment, just to, just to wrap this up, just this sort of this summary, we have this process, the assessment process, we have the, the particular tools or instruments that we utilize, we have the DSM-5 diagnostic criterion based on the big 11 that we're, that we're gathering and trying to discern uh, which of those 11 that our patients are meeting, and then we're looking at those ASAM levels those risk ratings in those each of those dimensions. Uh, this together is going to really allow us to make that accurate, informed, uh, responsible recommendation in that assessment process so that they can be engaged in the correct level of care. Best practice says it should be the least restrictive level of care. So uh, in other words, there are always exceptions to this, but in other words, if, if Richard's working full-time, has a good job, uh, is having some, some difficulty with his drinking and drug use, uh, he's never done treatment before, is open and willing to engage in services, I, rather than, do I think he would benefit from a residential placement? Probably, but he's never done treatment before. I want to offer and engage him in the least restrictive. So I would say, Richard, I'm recommending that you engage in a level 2.1 intensive outpatient. You can start tonight. Uh, we'll monitor for you a higher for you for a higher level of care. 
And if you're struggling, we can talk about that and we can we can get a bed date in the future for you to engage in residential treatment. Um, does that make sense? I mean, it's really about it's really about trying to meet the patient where they're at. Uh, yeah, Richard, uh, my my pretend virtual patient says uh, also possibly working with where the client is willing to start in treatment. Exactly. And that that would open up a whole other uh, uh, discussion because if Richard came to me and said, Steve, I really, I really don't want to completely quit drinking. I'd like to cut down. I would like to reduce my overall frequency and amount. Then really, I'm going to work with Richard about what that would look like and how we would we could work together to uh, you know to achieve that goal. That would be more harm reduction. You know, if he wants to go from drinking a 12 pack every day, to he wants to reduce that to six, six pack a day. That is a goal. That is where I would meet him. Um, and we would work together uh, on a risk reduction where abstinence is not the goal. Uh, it's a great point. I, I hope that's kind of what you were alluding to, Richard. But, uh, but yeah, definitely working with the patient or the client where they're at. And uh, we know that you know many of the patients, at least in our clinic, weren't there because they wanted to be. They usually had someone, you know, or something pushing them in, whether it was legal or uh, uh, you know probation or parole or employer or concern other. Uh, somebody thought they had a problem. They weren't convinced that they did. So there was always that element as well. Um, yes. Oh, yes. I. I Frank, I think, uh, you know, I, I really think harm reduction is something we're looking at doing, um, doing something in 23 on because uh, harm reduction is uh, really a hot topic with uh, federal government right now. And you know, we're funded through the federal government. So we're, we're really in tune with this idea of harm reduction. So it's definitely on our radar. And I'm looking at doing maybe a series on harm reduction uh, and having us have that discussion because I think as providers, uh, it took me a while to embrace this idea that not all my patients uh, are open to uh, talking or ready to embrace this idea of, of recovery, uh, abstinence-based recovery. Uh, it's really important to be able to shift gears and meet them where they're at. And so that's another topic and another conversation that I think I would Appreciate uh, you know learning from all of you and your experiences and sharing what I know about that topic as well. Um, so, one of the things we know is that mandated treatment versus versus voluntary treatment. Uh, a lot of the research says that outcomes are about the same. So, whether I'm forced in or whether I come in willingly, uh, how I do following my primary care is about the same, which I thought was interesting. Uh, so that's just something, that's just a little side note. Let's wrap this up with a uh, uh, final quiz question. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if a patient has at least one risk rating of three in those six dimensions, which level of treatment care should be considered during your assessment process? At least one risk rating of three Yes, yes, Richard, you, you, sir, uh, have won the prize. Uh, no, I, I appreciate everyone's, uh, A is the correct answer. And, and again, this is not, there's always going to be exceptions to this. You know, a patient could have a risk rating of three and still, uh, we could still make a case for a lower level of care, or we could make a case for a higher level of care. There may be other components to this comprehensive assessment process that would really push us to a higher level or a lower level of care. It's a general rule. Uh, it helps. It helps their. It helps my team have some consistency. If I said, "Well, what's his risk rating on readiness to change?" and you know, you say, "Well, it's a three. He's he's very reluctant to enter treatment, and uh, he's had a couple uh, other attempts at extended outpatient, and it's not gone well." Um, that that would be you know a great sort of foothold to say yes this seems like the right level of care based on uh, the patient's readiness to change or lack thereof and then what we would hope to see is that three after admission and engagement 
during the continued care portion where we would reevaluate those risk ratings, we would hope to see that maybe go from a three to a two when we staff the case, you know, each week and to see that re reduce. That's how we would monitor and justify the patients responding to, to their treatment services as well. So it's a great way to support progress, lack thereof, and advocate uh, for our patients uh, for a higher or lower level of care. It's, uh, it's really a great system. Uh, Dr. David Mealy is the sort of founder and, and creator of this system. Uh, look for uh, the, the fourth edition coming out sometime in 23. I've uh, been able to look through a, an advanced copy and uh, offer some feedback. So it's, it's exciting stuff. How are we on time, folks? Oh, look at that. I'm five minutes past. I want to honor everyone's time. Uh, let me post in the chat here real fast. Um, I'm just going to put up here. Let's see if I still got it. Yes. This is a link to the, 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 the brief survey. If you don't have time to do that today, uh, you can't follow the link today. We'll reach out to you post event. You'll have another opportunity to complete that short survey. We'd love to hear back from you. We've added a couple of short answer questions into this survey. So you can you know, jot down a couple of comments, uh, but our, the feedback we get from you guys is important. It not only gives us um, uh, you know, proof to our funders that we're doing what we, what we say we're gonna do, but uh, we really appreciate your feedback and learning from all of you. So yes, um, uh, TL, we will, uh, you will hear from us uh, post event. Our, our team will reach out to you and they will uh, they will give you um, an option to complete that survey again, and at that point you can request your uh, your certificate. You should get 1.5 CEUs for today's discussion. Wish we had more time today. I really appreciate uh, everybody engaging uh, in the conversation in the chat today. Thank you so much, everybody. Until next time, stay safe, stay connected, and stay healthy. And we're going to talk about treatment planning in December. So I hope you can come back and we'll build on what we've been talking about uh, these last couple of sessions. We're going to talk about creating treatment goals and treatment plans, this living document that follows the patient throughout their, their services with you. So thanks again, everybody. Tokcha, take care of yourselves. Tusen tak. I appreciate everybody. Goodbye.